Right then, hi everybody. This is uh, Table Tennis Chats number seven now. And today I've got a very special guest, someone from uh, a bit of a blast from the past again for me. Uh, it's my first ever table tennis coach. Uh, so I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Judy Higgs, played and coached in the Barton District Table Tennis League over a number of years. Not for some time now, but in my younger days, I played and then took up coaching and then ran club for young people to come and try table tennis. Excellent. And so, yeah, Judy, the first little question I had for you really to kind of expand on a bit more of who you are is how did you first get started in the sport? Um, I, I lived in Bath Easton, in the village in Bath Easton, and um, there was a church uh, youth club. And I was one of the younger ones. So I was, yeah, there were a lot of them older youngsters, teenagers, uh, and I started, um, I first came to the youth club and I was about 12, I think. Yeah, one of the things that was there was like snooker and table tennis and various things that people could do. Um, and I started to play table tennis. I wasn't interested in snooker, so I quite fancied having a go at table tennis. So I just used to sort of mess around at it, really. You know, I always had to wait because I was the youngest. I always had to wait at the end of the evening before I could even get on the table because everybody else was playing um but eventually yeah I sort of started playing a bit and just enjoyed it but only to mess around with and gradually as I got to be one of the older ones in the youth club I got more time playing on the table because there was only one table and just through practicing a lot yeah I got better but then I didn't really do anything in table tennis for a number of years um until I was working and nothing to do in the evening. I was still living at home and I was just desperate to get out of the house in the evenings because it was just me and my parents and my younger sister. But yeah, I kept thinking, what could I do as a sort of social activity? And I thought, well, yeah, I wasn't bad at table tennis when I was in youth club. And I thought, I'll see if I can find somewhere where I can just play for fun. You know, is there somewhere that I can play table tennis? I had no idea that there was a full league running in Bath because, you know, being a Bath Eastern, you're a bit on the outskirts. I sort of looked, um, I can't remember how I found out the information, but uh, eventually I found out that there was a league running in Bath and that Eric Wynne, late Eric Wynne, um, was running the league. And so I just gave him a call and I said, look, yeah, I used to play table tennis. Um, I'm looking to get into a, to start, you know, playing more regularly and what do I need to do? And he explains, you know, he says, you need to belong to a club. So he said, I'll have a word with some of the um, club chairmen and see if they're looking for any players for next season, because this was, I think, in the summer. So he said, I'll, I'll just have a chat with a few of them and see. And it so happened that Oldfield Park were looking for new players and they had one lady who was already playing, her name was Ginny Sherman, and she played for a number of years. And then another lady had joined her, Julie, and they were looking for a third lady to go in the league. And I just sort of said, oh no, I'm not ready to go in the league. You know, I'm really not that good. And they said, oh, well, just go along and have a, a practice and we'll see where you are standard wise and then we'll decide whether it's worth you going in the league or not. And if not, you can just go and practice in and maybe next year you could play. So, so I went along and I had a few practices and then I met up with Ginny Sherman and eventually with Julie and we had some practices and decided that we'd give it a go in the league. So we did. And that's where I started playing, you know, sort of regular matches, which was quite a step up at the beginning. You know, I was clueless. I had no idea. <laughs> Because there is a big difference between playing for fun and playing when you're a bit more serious about it. And obviously most of the players I played against were a lot better than me. So the first year was a bit of a struggle, but Ginny did well and Julie had played a bit more than I had before we started. So she did okay. And I just sort of here and there, I would win the odd match. Um, but we sort of scraped through our first season. I think we finished near the bottom of the league we may have even finished bottom but yeah that's how we started and we all got on really well which was which helped um and that yeah we sort of said well do we want to do this again next year and Ginny was really keen so I said well all right I'll give it a go um yeah and I did some practice in the summer and got slightly better 
and we will be played the next year and then over the next probably I don't know four or five years at least yeah we got to a point where we actually won our division and went up and we were amazed <laughs> so a lot of it is experience isn't it and practice and so yeah that sort of got me hooked then I thought oh perhaps I'm you know I'm getting better at this so you know we then carried on playing for a number of years and Julie uh, Taylor and myself you know we played together for a long time um, and then moved on to other teams but we played together for I can't remember how many years but a long time um, and that yeah that's how I got introduced to regular table tennis yeah, I was going to say, I was going to ask whether that was Julie Taylor because, um, yeah, she still plays in the league now for um, for Oldfield. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I play, I can't think how long ago it was, no, quite a while ago when I packed up because I was really busy at work and it was just becoming quite stressful and I thought, just got to give up something and I'm not giving up work at the moment. So, yeah, I just sort of stepped back and thought, so I've probably done as much as I can do and, yeah, time to stop now. But whenever, you know, if I'm away anywhere or you know, on holiday or something, there's a table tennis play table. I mean, John can play, obviously, and so we, we always have a knock around somewhere, you know, and enjoy it just for the fun of it. So, I mean, that was how I got started and how I started to play competitively. Yeah, I'm just picturing that summer where you, after the first season, we all went away and, you know, got, got a lot of practice in and got better. I can just imagine the Rocky music playing in the background for, for that summer there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. part of it was, um, you know, that uh, John, you know, my husband now, was the chair of the club and he used to go and practice in the summer, not lots, but, you know, they used to go once a week or something. And, you know, there was like a drop in arrangement so that anybody who wanted to play could just drop in and play. And so he used to play against anybody who turned up and so did some of the other players. So you got to play against better players and that always improves your game. Um, because you have to sort of step up a level if you're playing somebody good, <laughs> otherwise you just get totally wiped out. <laughs> so, um, so that was good. And then I think it was, I think it was the second second year we improved, and I think the third year, it may have been more than that, maybe more than three years. It took us to to get out of the bottom bottom division. We gradually got better, and then that first time we won our division, we were like over the moon. We were like, wow, we're really good now. <laughs> And we thought we were really good until we started playing in the next division up and then we realised we weren't that good. We had improved, but we weren't as good as we thought we were. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we went on playing um, and then I got asked to play in, um, in the men dip league. So I started playing there and then there was another league. I can't remember where it was now. Oh, in the Wiltshire League, but I didn't play very often in the Wiltshire League, only occasionally. But yeah, so, and then you kind of get, you know, it takes over your whole life. <laughs> but, you know, I used to enjoy it. As I say, it was a way of getting out of, out of the house and, you know, doing something different. And it was sort of fairly sociable. I mean, it's not the most sociable sport, but it was, you know, fairly sociable. You got to meet, meet a lot of other people that were, you know, enjoying table tennis. And you get to talk to them about what matches you and who you'd beaten in your division and all this kind of thing and who they'd beaten. So, um, yeah, it was good fun. Yeah, some really good, interesting points there. Because like you say, yeah, it is, it is quite social in its own way to meet diff different people in different walks of life. And we certainly, you know, mm -hmm. from stepping up the leagues, we certainly found it hard when we came from Div 2 into Div 1. And old money would have been Div 3 to Div 2, I guess. Um, but yeah, oh, no, so we were in, we were in, when we started, we were in Division 8. So there were lots more divisions then. So we had a long way to, as I say, work our way up. And I think the highest I ever played was probably Division 1. Um, I never played in the Premier Division, um, but Division 1, and that was hard. Yeah, that was a real struggle sometimes. But, yeah, that took us about, I don't know, probably almost, it could have been as long as 10 years to get up to that level. Yeah, but you learn every time you play, you know, and every time you get beaten, you learn something. So over time, like with all things, you know, you get better. The more you practice, the better you get. And we used to practice in the summer as well when we got really keen and we started winning matches. <laughs> we wanted to play all the time. So we used to practice in the summer, you know, for a lot, lot of people 
they didn't do much practice before the beginning of the season. So we'd been practicing for some time and we'd come in and we'd be, you know, some really good results at the beginning of the season. And then everybody would catch up with us because as they got back into playing again, you know, they'd catch up and we'd struggle the second half of the season. But you did, you know, each year, and particularly when you went up and up and sometimes down in the league, you know, you'd meet new people. And, and that was part of it, and new people and different ways of playing. It's amazing how many different styles there are in table tennis. Part of the challenge is when you come up against somebody that plays a very strange way, and you have to work out how you can play against them, how you can beat them. And, and that's part of the challenge. And that's what makes it interesting, I think. You know, everybody plays differently. Well, yeah, my dad in particular, you know, left-handed, um, mm-hmm. And you know, no, no forehand. So yeah, very difficult player for some people to to try and you yeah. know play. Even now in his seventies, he's um, still picks some some results in the division two there. Yeah, yeah, that's it. If you don't come across something like that, you don't really know what to do to to negate what he's doing to to work out how to play. Him. So yeah, there are a few players, particularly as we went up into the higher divisions, that have some very unusual styles. Um, and you just sort of try and work out, you know, the first time you'd just be completely sort of bamboozled by what they did. And then, you know, you'd sort of think, well, there's got to be a way of doing, you know, playing my game against this person. Um, and so eventually you would work it out. Well, yeah, especially when you've got so, a left-handed chopper and then suddenly he's trying to flick a forehand like this. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But... Um, yeah, we used to enjoy it. Sometimes, you know, it's very nice going out in the dark and the weather was horrible, but, you know, because it's a winter game. But um, once you got there, it's fine. The only thing was the longer, uh, the higher up the divisions go, the longer the matches are. And so sometimes you'd be playing till midnight. And then by the time you got home, it would be sort of half past one, uh, half past 12, quarter to one. And then you've got to get up from work the following day and you're like, oh, do I really want to do this? <laughs> but, yeah, it, next week you turn up and sort of think, OK, here we go again. Then. So, yeah, yes, but, that was good. So did you play many games um, when the rules changed up to 11 or was it mainly up to 21 when you were playing league? No, I did play up to 11. I think I preferred playing up to 21 because it sometimes took me a while to get into a game. And so you have more time to adjust your game and work out what your opponent was doing. Whereas with the shorter games, um, they were coming in not long before I finished. Um, and, you know, everything's over very quickly. You know, once you go a game down, then, you know, you've really got to, you know, adjust your game in order to get back into the, the whole set. Because otherwise, you know, if you go two games down, then, yeah, that's it <laughs> So, um, yeah, so I didn't play many with the short games, yeah, with the short sets, but, yeah, I preferred the longer game. Yeah, so I think that rule change must have come in maybe 15 to 20 years ago, because I think I must have been, you know, just teenage years possibly when that came in, I think. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I don't know if that encouraged younger players to play with the shorter games or... Maybe they just didn't know any different, so they just took that as that's how it's played. Sometimes it was quite interesting to play a long game, and you know, during the course of that game, you'd work out what you were supposed to do to stop your opponent beating you, and so you know, it gave you a bit more time to try and you know, work that out and then work out what you're going to do to stop them <laughs> or to dominate with your game, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, I think it was different for me because I don't think I had a very strong service game when I was a kid and I probably still don't now. So uh, I just try and vary it as much as I can in the two serves you get. But I think that kind of helped me yeah. not develop my, yeah. not rely on my serve so heavily and get actually into the point and, and play the point more. So yeah, interesting yeah. ways of playing. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's different and it suited some people and it didn't suit others. I think... You know, it, it used to depend how good your concentration was as well, because if you're playing a, a, a longer game, you have to really focus on that game. Whereas when you play shorter games, you have a break in between and you can kind of refocus. <laughs> you can refocus on, you know, sort of think, oh, well, I've lost that first game, but it's best of, what was it used to be, best of five? Can't yeah. remember. Um, so, you know, you sort of think, oh, if I win the next one, I'm back in, you know. But it is... Um, you know, it's all over very quickly with the short games. 
you know, in terms of winning a game goes very quickly. You know, you have to react quite quickly in the next set, in the next game. Otherwise, you know, the whole set's gone and that's it. So, um, yeah. yeah. A lot more emphasis on the point, isn't it? Point by point game play rather than think mm. I can go five points down and then still come back and, and win that game there. Yeah. I mean, you used to see people in, in the longer games, you know, they might be 11 1 down or something and they'd still work their way back into the game. But, but with the short games, obviously, you don't have that option. So, it, it did change the way the game was, not so much the way it was played, but it made it easier for some people and harder for others. Yeah, I suppose if I if I played the short game for long enough, I probably would have adapted, worked out a way of using that those breaks and, you know, starting new games to sort of, you know, do better. <laughs> Definitely. And so um, go, going back a bit, so you said that your first club was uh, Oldfield. Mm-hmm. And you had to obviously um, seek that out actively and, and phone the chap uh, in charge to, mm. you know, go and find yourself a club. Yeah. And that's, we touched on it as well. You met um, John, your husband there. Um, that's right. The first time I met him. Yeah. <laughs> Very first night I went to practice. He was the one who was there, you know, opening up the club and, and you know, gave me a little knock and sort of introduced himself and explained a little bit, not much, but explained a little bit about how the league worked. And I was like, I'm not ready to play properly. I'm not ready to play competitively yet. <laughs> and it was like, well, that's okay, but just yeah, come along and practice. And then I uh, think Ginny and Julie came in later in the evening. Um, we all got to know each other and had a bit of a practice. And yeah, that was kind of yeah. I I didn't think I was going to be good enough to play in the league. And I have to say, the very first match that I ever played in the Bath League, um, we played at the what was then the police station in Mamba Street okay. and upstairs in the police station they had the table in the middle of the room and there are pillars all around the room and you, you know they played there and they knew how to put the ball near the pillars so that you can get it back <laughs> and yeah and also they were you know six foot tall strapping lads <laughs> and you know I was five foot nothing <laughs> And it's nervous as anything, so I didn't do very well in my first match. But I think I think the police might have won the league, won our division that year. So you know, we sort of looked back on that and thought, for a first game, we did okay. It was quite a shock when you play competitively, even when you practice a lot. When you first play competitively, it's a real shock how quickly the game goes, you know, and the points go, um, and you know you'd have to learn very quickly tactics and concentration and and how to move and how to um, react to what somebody does um, and that I mean the more you play the more you learn that but and watching other people you learn as well and, and so with John at the uh, at Oldfield Club as well back then was when you first met was he one of the the better players there or and sort of what did you yeah. learn from him when you were knocking with him um, well, just consistency, really, because he could always get the ball back, you know, wherever it went, <laughs> he could always get the ball back. I mean, that was the thing, you know, when you start, you know, you try to play sort of big smashes and they just fly all over the place, you know. But, I mean, he obviously was at a different level to where I was, um, so he was just keeping the ball coming back at me all the time. It was great for practice, it was brilliant because you know you just get into a pattern of playing balls over and over and over again and that's the way you learn and I find that in coaching later on part of the learning process you just that consistency is really important and your basic strengths that you just play without having to give them any thought really. It was really useful when I went into coaching you know to have done gone through that experience. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll touch on the coaching in a moment, but I just wanted to ask mm. you, when you started um, with uh, Julie Taylor and uh, the other lady in the league and you started mm. going up the leagues a little bit, did you ever set yourself um, sort of ambitious targets or goals and sort of did you meet them, you know, towards the end of your career? Do you look back and think, actually, yeah, I did what I set out to yeah. do? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think we did. So with Ginny, I mean, she was the best player when it started. And Julie was better than me because she played a season before me. So she was slightly more experienced. Um, and the first year, we I think we ended up bottom, but one in the division in the bottom of the league. And we were like, oh, <laughs> okay. Then. Um, and 
Julie and I were sort of thinking, oh, maybe we won't do this again. But Ginny talked us into it, you know, because she was a bit more experienced. And she said, oh, no, no, everybody struggles at the beginning. Yeah, we'll keep going at this. And the next year we sort of got to the middle of our division, I think. And then the next year we got up a bit higher. And then when we actually, I don't know if we won the league or came second, but when we got high enough to be promoted, that was amazing. And we were like, oh, actually, we can play. Um, and then a lot, lot of you know, divisions. So it took a long time to move up through the, the levels of the league. And I think the ha highest I ever played was Division One. I. I think we played there for a few years, but by then numbers that played were dropping. So there were less divisions. So as we were going up, you know, they sort of went down to six league, six divisions. And then, you know, by the time we were in Division One, I, I think there were only about four or five divisions. So although we'd worked our way up, yeah, you know, there were less people below us who were coming in at the bottom. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, the league has shrunk so much. And the majority of the players, certainly when I finished, were elderly, you know, in terms of sport and were playing just for the social side of it. And there were very few young people coming into the game. So, yeah, I mean, I think we felt we went as far as we could. And I can't remember if we won the first division. I'm not sure if we actually won the first division on one occasion, but I may be wrong about that. But we got very near to it, even if we didn't win it. So, yeah. Yeah, that's good. So did you set yourself sort of um, averages or points tallies in, in your own mind personally to think, actually, I want to get 40%, 50%, anything like this? What was your mindset? Uh, I think you always wanted to, you know, do better than the year before, obviously. And it was more, um, I think in table tennis, there's certain players that you find more difficult to play. There's some that when you play them, you know that you can beat them as long as you, you know, do what you're supposed to do. Um, but there are some players that you find really awkward because of their unusual style. And it takes you a long time to work out how to play them. Um, and that was always my aim. You know, the people that I find really difficult is to work out how I could beat them. And, you know, that was a challenge. And some of them I did work out and some of them I still don't know how to beat them. <laughs> because it's such an odd style. Um, but that's the joy of the game, isn't it? That you, you play even in a well, match, it used to be three by three versus three people and everybody played everybody else. I don't think it is now, is it? It's not the same. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you would play three completely different style of players. Often, you know, you might play one person who's really defensive and you just have to sort of chisel away all night trying to get points off them. And then you play somebody who was a big hitter, you know, could hit the ball past you and you wouldn't even see it coming. Um, you know, and then you might play somebody who put lots of spin on the ball and, and you had to learn how to just control the spin. So it was always you know interesting in that sense that you know you, it's um I'm trying to think when you watch tennis these days there seems to be an awful lot of shots that are very similar in tennis whereas you know in table tennis it, there was a lot of variety of styles and um, some people played like john my husband played from a long way back behind the table and just sort of looped the ball up and back onto the table. And other people would be right in your face almost, yeah, right close to the table, trying to force you back off, you know, to back off. And so, you know, there is a tremendous variety of, of styles and ways to win. And I, I, when I used to play with Julie, um, Julie Taylor, she was trying to bore people to death. <laughs> she would just keep putting the ball back, putting the ball back and with lots of backspin and slowing the game down. Um, and that was the way she won. And, yeah, you know, I used to sit there and watch it and sort of think, oh, my goodness, this is so boring. <laughs> I mean, I appreciated that she got the results and she was good. But I just used to think, gosh, go on and hit the ball. <laughs> Don't just keep it, chopping it back. And, um, but, I mean, she won more games than I did, so perhaps I should have done more of the chopping and less of the hitting. <laughs> So, but you know, even within our team, there were three different styles. Yeah, we all played a different way, and we all tried to help each other out if we were struggling. Sort of say, "Oh, try doing this," or "Try doing that." And particularly Ginny, when we started, you know, she would say, "I'll oh, just try and do this," or "Try not to let them do something." You know, it, that's as I say, that's the interesting part of the game that everybody plays differently, 
um, it's a ch different challenge, whoever you're playing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, Julie's certainly still playing in the same style now. I mean, last season she beat one or two of the players in my team. Um, I've played her twice in three years now. Thankfully, I just came out on top in both. But, yeah, still very, very yeah. strong opponent. And so what yeah. sort of style, yeah. style of play? Was it more spinny, more attacking? Sorry, me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I used to attack more. I used to get bored with the defensive stuff. So I used to try and top spin it more and try and move people around. I mean, Julie's got endless patience. Yeah, I used to admire that in her. She would just keep doing the same thing. Uh, and I did to, up to a point in my style. I wanted to play that way. I wanted to be attacking and to be a bit more aggressive. But often, you know, you couldn't do that because the other person had a better defence. And so you had to be patient and just keep sending the ball back until you thought you had the right one to hit. <laughs> and then sometimes you did and sometimes you didn't. <laughs> true, true. And so yeah. then obviously, um, going, going back again, so uh, obviously you and uh, John met and, and got married through, you know, sort of mutual interest. Yeah, table tennis, yeah, yeah. We, there used to be um, a table tennis ball at the end of the year, presentation ball. Oh, wow. I don't know if that was still going when you were around. Um, but yeah, they used to have a posh do. I think we ended up having the last one in the pump rooms or something like that. Oh. And it, there was a big presentation that was quite a, you know, prestigious occasion for table tennis and you know all the players would come um and all the trophies and the you know, awards got handed out at, at that thing and i was i can't remember if i was going or not but anyway john was going with somebody else that fell through and so he asked me and that's the first time that he really you know got to know each other <laughs> so and then you know we've been together ever since as i say <laughs> Excellent. And um, obviously your, your kids both played to a certain extent as well. We had Gareth on, uh, on the last chat on number six. Um, mm. how, how much of an influence did uh, you and John have on, on their decisions to play or not to play? Did you kind of push them in one direction or let them sort of do their own thing? No, I mean, Gareth sort of took an interest because both of us played and when we were on holiday and things like that, you know, we played with him and he enjoyed it. And then when I was coaching at Culver Hay, he used to come there to practice and Emma used to as well. My daughter Emma used to come as well. And so they sort of enjoyed being in that environment where there are other people their age. And because they played a bit against us, um, they probably had the edge on most of the children that were there because they knew the basics. <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, Gareth kept going longer than Emma. Emma sort of lost interest and went on to do other things. Um, but Gareth still kept playing for some time, you know, well, until he, well, not until he left home, but until he got, you know, went to work. And so, you know, and he's obviously kept his interest, even though he can't play regularly necessarily. Yeah, so he enjoyed it and Emma enjoyed it, but she never really was that serious about it. It was just something she did um, for fun and she liked the social side of the, of the coaching club, which is as important for children, I think. Yeah, there's been some element of, fun in it for them because if you make it all too serious they'll give it up <laughs> well definitely and I've, I've made gareth promise me that he's going to find the table down at his plymouth church now so he's going to dig that out um he should have done ah. already so we got to hold him to account yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> i shall see him in a couple of weeks um we're going down to see them so i should say to him in fact i'm seeing him this week i think he's coming up here so i should say to him have you got the table out ready for mark <laughs> exactly exactly and so we come on to the coaching element now, because obviously you start to progress through the leagues. And um, what kind of flipped your mind into the coaching element of the game? I, I don't know. There was a lot of talk going on at that time about the fact that there were, you know, most of the players in the league were older and ageing, and that there didn't seem to be anybody coming in to fill, you know, the, the gaps at the bottom of the league. You know, no new players coming in to sort of continue the league on. And and it was obvious as I got towards the end of my playing career that numbers were dropping significantly because we were dropping the uh, number of teams in the league every single year you know and then you drop a whole division and so you know it, something needed to be, to be done if we wanted children to get involved or young people to get involved and by then most of the youth clubs had disappeared and so I think somebody was advertising a coaching course and I sort of thought, 
oh, I wouldn't mind having to go at that. So um, I sort of put my name down and I said, okay, I'll go and see what it's all about. And we went off uh, up in the Midlands somewhere and went to this coaching meeting. And then they said, oh, yeah, there's coaching courses that are available. And I think that Lee sponsored me to go. Um, and so I went and did my, you know, did this initial coaching course. And, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Just sort of thinking more about the game and learning how to teach other people to play what was then perceived as being the correct way. Uh, and, you know, also, I mean, I was very aware that there were less and less youngsters coming into the league, partly because of the setup, because you go out, you know, in the middle of the evening, you don't get back till 11 o'clock most times, sometimes midnight by the time. If you've gone to Chippenham for a match, you know, it might be midnight before you get home. And, yeah, that's not something that parents are very keen on. So, yeah, I was aware that there were very few youngsters coming in. Then I got um, invited by the council to run some sessions for them in schools. Uh, and I think that's where I met you. But... <laughs> Um, amongst a lot of other children um, and then you know that sort of got some enthusiasm for for coaching and actually doing the practical stuff with youngsters yeah you know, I sort of had this idea that we really ought to provide somewhere where youngsters could play on their own and young people could play and they weren't always playing against you know some 40 year old man who had been playing for years and didn't give them a chance to sort of practice properly just sort of hit the ball past them all the time so um, that's how, well, that's how Colgrahey School Coaching came about, but it was all sponsored by the council. It was part of one of their schemes to get children involved in sport. Um, and so uh, they uh, made a contribution money-wise to get it set up and buy some of the equipment we had there. I think we used, um, there was a grant scheme that Leeds could apply, or all sports could apply for equipment and um then they had to use it for development. So that's how we got into, that's how I got into coaching at Culver Hay. And that, I think, probably was the, the best bit of my table tennis career. I really enjoyed doing it. You know, people used to sort of say to me, oh, you know, how many kids have you got who are going to play in the league? And I said, I don't know yet, because they've only just picked up a bat. And, you know, they'll take a while, but uh, eventually some of them will come into the league. But even then, I was aware that the chances of many of them playing league table tennis was very slim because of the hours involved, you know, coming out late at night, going off with a couple of strangers to, you know, in the middle of nowhere to play table tennis, not going back to 11 o'clock at night sometimes, um, was just not acceptable to most parents. You know, they weren't going to get let their sort of eight, nine, ten-year-olds go off and do that. By the time I had sort of been running the, the sessions at Culverhay for a while, um, I realised that, you know, what we needed to do was to have a junior league somewhere, to have a hall where everybody played against everybody else in the, you know, week by week in, in the same building. And parents could drop their children off at six o'clock in the evening, come back and pick them up at eight, and they could play their table tennis and play competitively or, you know, just do coaching if they weren't ready for competition. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, that's how I got involved, um, you know, with table tennis. I mean, I always knew that my, my dad had played and I'd seen the trophies in the dining room on our little, like, you know, shelves and what have you, um, <laughs> different bits and pieces. Many runners up though, dad, i got to say. But, um, <laughs> but I thought that was really cool that you could win trophies for table tennis. And obviously um, I knew you um, through Sunday school um, at yeah. our church. Yeah. And then when you came in to Morelands Junior School, the school I was at when I was about what, eight, nine year old um, and just playing for a full hour of table tennis and, you know, realising that you could pick up a bat and start hitting the ball, you know, quite well from, mm. from the off. It was a, you know, great encouragement. And then yeah. I, I kind of remember that we, we did the coaching on a Thursday night, I think it was, up at Culver Hay. And you yeah. could, um, it wasn't just like attendance awards. You got awards for concentration for hitting mm. the ball properly, mm. doing different mm. things like this. Um, and then certainly that league structure as well. Um, I remember my first ever trophy, which I can't see it actually. I've got it somewhere about here, but it was in 1998. I think I was 10 years old um, and I played your son in the finals of the handicap. Um, yeah. yeah. destroyed me. So I got the runners up. Just <laughs> you know? Yeah. It was, yeah. A, it was a nice little thing, you know, thing to have. And that's what encourages the kids to, 
to keep going. I mean, I, I was oh, yeah. never going to be yeah. world champion or champion of Avon or what have you, but you know, it was really good yeah. for to, to see. Um, yeah, I mean, we used to run, I think, well, once a year we, had, we used to have a championships at Colbride. Um, I know, yeah, it was quite hard work to get anybody from the league to come along and support it. And the chairman, who I can't remember who, I think it was probably, I'm trying to think who was, what his name was, Bob somebody, and I can't think of his surname. Um, but he was a very good supporter of the league. And he came along and gave out prizes, you know, and there are little, these little plastic medals. And it meant a lot to the children, you know, to, to have won something, you know, and, and it sort of kept them going and kept their enthusiasm uh, in the sense that, you know, I just decided what we were going to do and that's what we did. Um, but, you know, it was a balance between trying to make it enjoyable, but equally doing something worthwhile during the evening, not just running around like mad things, hitting balls all over the place. Or, um, And I always used to say to the kids, if you're coming to table tennis, if you're coming here to play table tennis, we're playing table tennis. And, you know, you can throw a few games in that make it fun. Um, but, yeah, I would never let them just run riot. Um, yeah, it's funny you said that because I had to use exactly, almost exactly the same wordings when I started Kingsham Table Tennis Club um, here in, you know, obviously here in Kingsham. And I had um, yeah. about eight teenagers that came along, quite young teenagers, and they would run around and, and mess about and shout at each other, different schools and what have you. And yeah, almost yeah. Like, I'm exactly the same as you said there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was easier for me because mine were, I think they were under 12s or something. We had a limit, an age limit, because it was essentially about getting youngsters. Um, and that came, that grew out of that program that we did. I think it was Marcus Berry and I that went, went into schools all over Bath and the surrounding area and did uh, just one-off sessions where we came in. And, and the critical thing about those sessions was that everybody had a bat. And when you gave a bat to each of the children, they were like, oh, am I allowed to do something? I don't just have to watch them. I can do something. Give them a bat and the ball. And sometimes it was chaos because all these balls were flying everywhere. But it was just that feeling, I think, that somebody had actually given them a bat and said, OK, you can play. You don't have to stand and watch. You can play and join in. Um, and they were chaotic because there were 30 children in a room with. Um, and most of the schools that we turned up, up at um they used to say well what what are you going to do how are you going to manage 30 children in this ring and we sort of said well don't worry because it's going to be lots of different activities for them to do um and they said oh we haven't got any tables and we said no that's fine we use the dining tables um and we have these plastic nets we could just put across the table which were fine um so it's just finding different ways of doing it so that it fitted the circumstances and, and we played, we did the coach, coaching session, as it was called, um, in some absolutely horrendous places. I mean, I know Swainswick School, I think it was. We just had a classroom, not much bigger than my dining room, with 30 children in. And we were trying to teach them to do something. And it was a bit chaotic. And I got the impression the teachers weren't very up for it out there. So yeah. um, we managed something. But, um, yeah. It, it, it was just a way of showing kids that, you know, um, to play table tennis, you have to have a certain element of control. You can't just sort of wave your arms about wildly. And also, um, you know, it can be fun and, and you can play. You don't have to have a proper table and, you know, proper facilities. You can play on the dining room table if your parents are you. So. <laughs> So this is the first uh, table tennis chat I'm going to put into two parts because this was a bit of a bumper conversation with me and Judy, Judy here, a lot to uh, catch up on. So yeah, please stick around for part two, it'll be linked uh, you know, in the description and on the end cards uh, when it's available. But thanks all for watching, uh, please do subscribe, uh, like, share this video, put any comments below if you used to know Judy or play with her, uh, that'd be great and hopefully you've got some value out of this video. And like I say, part two will be coming very, very soon. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Cheers, and see you again soon.